Anyway, they have a so-called laugh center in their midbrain, and it activates when someone tickles the animals or when they engage in some fun and playful activities. Scientists discovered this in 2016 after tickling the rodents on their bellies and listening to their squeaky giggles. Now, hummingbirds are the only birds we know about that can fly backward. They mostly do it when they want to move away from flowers. And here's an animal that can't go backward, a kangaroo. They can hop around and cross great distances, but the structure of their strong rear feet and big tails prevent them from walking backwards. Narwhals are those weird creatures that look like some sort of sea unicorns. That horn on their head is not a tusk. It's a giant tooth that sticks out through the upper lip of male narwhals. This tooth is probably one of the tools that plays a role in attracting ladies. Now, flamingos are not actually pink. They're born gray, but throughout their life, they eat lots of algae and other foods that contain a red-orange pigment we know as beta-carotene, like in carrots. This pigment gets broken down and ends up in their skin and feathers, which is what makes them pink. They need to eat a lot of such food to stay like that, though. If we humans wanted to change our skin color, we wouldn't be able to eat enough food rich in beta-carotene to really turn pink, or in our case, maybe even orange. Sloths are really slow. All the jokes and memes about them are true, but they're also very skilled swimmers, and they move in the water around 3 to 4 times quicker than on land. They can do breaststroke just like people, and it's an important skill for them to have because they're tropical animals that mostly live in jungles, and those areas are often flooded. Tigers are the biggest members of the feline family, yup, even bigger than lions. And no tiger has the same set of stripes. Their coat is actually a camouflage that comes in handy when they need to find a good spot where their prey won't see them. Interestingly, their skin is striped too, not just the coat. Their stripes are as unique as our fingerprints. Now even though they look kind of funny and innocent, you wouldn't want to bother a platypus. These wild animals are some of the few mammal species that can poison you. They have spurs on the tips of their back feet that can release venom. It's not potent enough to pose a life threat, but the sting can still be very painful and can cause swelling and other issues. When a ladybug needs to defend itself against potential predators, it starts bleeding from its knees. Now, it's not actual blood coming out of its joints. It's a certain chemical that smells bad and, therefore, repels predators. They have another mechanism that helps them survive in the harsh animal kingdom, their specific color. Predators really don't like the combinations of bright colors, such as red, orange, and black, because they know that creatures colored this way can taste awful. Roosters can get extremely noisy in the morning, but they don't go deaf because they don't even hear how loud their crowing can be. What keeps them safe is special built-in noise protection plugs. Hens have the same system that reduces the risk of hearing loss, too. Not only do they have this protection, but they can also regrow cochlear hair ears if they get damaged in only a couple of days. Owls don't have eyeballs. They have something that's more like eye tubes, and they can't move them back and forth like we do with our eyeballs, which is why these birds have incredibly flexible necks. They're able to rotate their heads 270 degrees. For comparison, humans can only manage 180. That's why owls have a specific system of blood vessels in their heads. It delivers fresh blood to the brain if the bird turns its head too quickly and cuts off circulation. Just keep swimming. <laughs> you may remember how Dory the Blue Tang sang this in Finding Nemo. Dory wasn't a shark, but that's a message some shark species need to take literally. Mako sharks, great whites, whale sharks, and some other kinds need to keep swimming. Otherwise, they'll stop breathing. We use our lungs for breathing, and some sharks use a method called buccal pumping. This means they swim with their mouths open. That way, they allow water to flow through their gills and thus extract oxygen. The most dangerous animal on our planet isn't a bear, a shark, or some toothy tiger. It's something way smaller, the mosquito. Not only is it extremely irritating, but it also transfers serious diseases such as yellow fever, malaria, or dengue fever. 
Annually, hundreds of thousands of people don't survive the battle with those diseases. Mosquitoes also outnumber every other creature across the globe, apart from termites and ants. Grizzly bears are incredibly strong animals with a bite powerful enough to crush a bowling ball. That's why you won't see them allowed in bowling alleys. Despite that, they're mostly light eaters. They're strong enough to make a meal out of whatever they come across, including a bison, moose, or elk. But they still like to munch on their fruits, nuts, berries, and even a small unfortunate mouse that gets lost and ends up in the predator's mouth. The inland taipan is the most venomous snake on the planet. We know it as the western taipan. It lives in Australia. Just one bite has enough venom to turn out fatal for at least 100 fully grown humans. And it can also do the job within only half an hour if you don't have anything to treat the bite right away. They say these snakes are mostly shy and they mind their own business. But like other animals, they will attack if they feel threatened or provoked. There's a kind of turtle that can stay alive for months under the ice by breathing through its behind. When it gets colder, some animals can't find safe places to stay, so they must survive harsh winter conditions wherever they are. And while bees get cozy in their nests and bears sleep in caves, painted turtles stay in their ponds that freeze over. Since the ice limits their access to air, they extract oxygen directly from the water and breathe through their behinds. Yes, that would be handy. It's well known that ravens are incredibly intelligent animals. They're excellent at solving problems, but it seems they also have impressive social intelligence. They're very in tune with their feelings as well as the emotions of their mates. If one raven in the group feels pessimistic, it's likely to bring the others down too. A real buzzkill. When they see a bird that doesn't like certain food and expresses it in a very vivid way, they lose interest in their own food as well. The pistol shrimp is one of the loudest animals in the world, even though it's tiny, only about three quarters of an inch long. When it senses food, it opens its large claw that can grow as long as half its body length and lets him water it. Then it snaps the claw shut extremely fast, which shoots out a very strong jet of bubbles. These bubbles can stun or even finish the prey the shrimp is trying to catch. And when the bubbles pop, it produces a snapping sound, louder than anyone would expect. Crocodiles are even scarier than we thought, because many of them can gallop like horses. They probably inherited this ability from their ancient ancestors, who were as small as cats, had long legs, and could run at speeds of about 11 miles per hour. Smaller crocodiles probably gallop when something's after them. But caimans and alligators obviously don't need to use this skill. It's you who's more likely to gallop away when you see them. Well, it's that time of year again, spring cleaning. Making your way outside, you grab the duster and broom to get rid of all those cobwebs on your windows. They don't stand a chance this time. Removing one cobweb after the other, you suddenly notice some weird-shaped mud stuck under the eaves and porch. What's this? It suddenly dawns on you. These have to be mud dauber wasp nests. You're probably thinking there's a swarm of them around with so many nests being side by side. Luckily, mud dauber wasps are solitary insects. Whew! All those little mud huts are filled with paralyzed spiders. Sometimes, even up to 500 spiders can be trapped in these lockers, just waiting for the wasp young to hatch. If the nest has holes, it may indicate the nest is inactive or old, as mud dauber wasps create holes when they leave the nest. If you're not going to remove them, it's best to wait till nighttime when they're not as active. While they're pretty placid, if they feel threatened, they won't hesitate to stay. Looking like someone got halfway through building one insect and forgot what part came next, the mole cricket is one insect that really looks out of this world. With claws like a mole, a body of a cricket, and the head of a shrimp, this critter is like the platypus of the insect world. They're not venomous and will only bite if you trap them inside your hand. And if you really annoy it, it's got something else up its sleeve. The wings. 
they can spit a foul-smelling brown liquid from their body, just like a skunk. So just let them leave your home, and there will be nothing to clean up. Rock pools are teeming with all sorts of plant and animal life. Sea creatures, such as starfish, seagrass, hermit crabs, tiny fish, and all types of octopuses. If you come across this tiny blue-ringed octopus, it's best to leave it alone. It's flashing neon blue at you for a reason. This miniature octopus has a venomous bite that's a thousand times stronger than cyanide, with no antidote available. Don't poke it with a stick or try to pick one up. It's not worth the trip to the hospital or the morgue. Snakes on land are scary, but sea snakes are on an entirely different level. Found in the Indian and Pacific Oceans, there are about 50 different species of sea snakes, and they're beautiful as much as they're dangerous. Luckily, they don't seem to worry about us too much. The Dubois sea snake is arguably the most venomous snake in the ocean, with the big sea snake not far behind. Their venom makes a cobra's bite seem like a walk in the park. The venom of both these snakes is extremely dangerous. Good thing for us that their venom can take hours to cause any symptoms in humans. If they can bite through your wetsuit, that is. Now, if this fly lands on your arm outside, you might just scream a little. Hey, I wouldn't blame you. The scorpion fly, as its name suggests, has a curved tail that looks just like a scorpion stinger. But you can breathe a sigh of relief. This is only used for mating. It also has a long beak-like head that's used to feed after stealing insects from spiders' webs. To find the perfect partner, they love to give the equivalent of a box of chocolates and flowers. Except theirs is saliva. Hmm, how romantic. If you happen to be in Africa, you might just miss this large bird if you're not paying attention. The shoebill will just casually stand still as you walk right on by. Growing up to 5 feet tall with an 8-foot wingspan, the shoebill sounds like an apex predator, though it's anything but. Known as one of the most slow-moving birds, almost statue-like, the shoebill just eats fish near the surface of the water, without a care in the world. This bird isn't afraid of humans at all. While they won't naturally come over to talk about the weather, they'll allow us to get close enough for some photos. Now, if you hear a small squeaking sound while you're in the garden, it could be a mouse, a squirrel, or a rhinoceros beetle is letting you know that you are too close. They love to make a racket when bothered. With a giant scary horn on top of their head, they might seem like they're able to defend themselves with it. But that's not possible at all. That's only to move leaves and sticks out of their way and to stop other males from coming into the female beetle's area. Not only have they got a horn on their head, but they've also got Herculean strength, able to lift 850 times their own weight. It's like you or me lifting 65 tons or 11 elephants. Hey, let's try it. Nah. Found mainly in China, the small tufted deer looks adorable with its tuft of hair. That is, until it turns around. Oh no, it's a vampire deer! Luckily, this animal doesn't want to taste your blood or wear a cape. Only males grow these during the mating season, rather than antlers, to fight over territories and female tufted deer. These fangs are more like elephant tusks than sharp teeth. Not only do they have fangs, but they're also known to bark like a dog and flee like a cat when they're scared. Red sky at night, sailor's delight. Red sky in the morning, sailor's warning. No one said anything about a red tide, though. The red tide is a toxic algal bloom that rises up from the seafloor after particularly bad storms. This algae looks a lot like spilled ketchup or rust in the water, but it's much worse for the life around it. Fish and marine life will try to escape once exposed to the toxic algae in their water. It's not particularly harmful to humans who are exposed to it. But if you eat seafood contaminated with its toxins, things can become a bit more serious. So if the sea is red, just stay out of the water. Some spiders love to show off with bright colors to show they're dangerous. 
not the Sydney funnel-web spider of Australia. This glossy black spider doesn't need theatrics to prove it's tough. These bad-tempered crawlers cause serious alarm when they decide to bite us. It can shut down our entire nervous system in as little as 30 minutes. Making their web in any shelter, like old logs, shoes, or even garden gnomes, the funnel web spiders like to live close to our surroundings for easy food. When they get tired of an area, they just leave their web behind and wander off to find somewhere new. <laughs> Perfect! Some say honey badgers don't care, and I think they might be right. When you're brave enough to take food away from a jaguar, lion, or hyena, hey, what do you got to fear? These tough relatives of the weasel aren't just ferocious, they're super smart. Known to even use tools to escape from enclosures. Objects like rakes, stones, and mud just become things to climb for freedom. Aside from their physical similarities to the skunk, the honey badger also boasts a dangerous gland in its tail containing a powerful stink machine. So they're tough, stinky, have extremely stretchy and strong skin, and to top it all off, they've got a strong immunity to scorpions and snakes. The best thing to do if you walk into a honey badger is to leave it alone. What chance do we have? Ever heard of the fungus strawberries and cream? No? What about its other name, the bleeding tooth fungus? This fungus isn't toxic, but tastes so bitter that you might think twice about trying some. When young and growing, this white mushroom appears to have red jelly coming out of its pores. This sticky liquid is sap that's pushed up from taking on too much water. The adult mushroom is just a boring beige compared to this. Underneath the mushroom cap, where its spores are produced, it has a tooth-like structure, just to make it even weirder. Tasmanian devils have a reputation for being bad-tempered when threatened by a predator, fighting other males, or getting a place at the table for dinner. They're dubbed devils because of the teeth-bearing, lunging, and one of the scariest shrieks you'll ever hear in the middle of the night. They'll also eat pretty much anything they can get a hold of, too. They don't habitually go for people, although they will defend themselves if they're cornered. With such a powerful bite, you wouldn't want to be on the receiving end. Good thing the Tassie Devils would much rather escape as well. Lions, elephants, and bears! Oh my! Three of the most beautiful yet intimidating members of the animal kingdom. But what intimidates these creatures, if anything? You might be surprised. Let's take a look. How about we start with the universally recognized king of the jungle, the lion. We'll get to the elephants in a moment, but there's actually one in the room. You know, the one that claims that a certain jungle cat is afraid of the most vital substance known to man? A small hint, it covers 70% of Earth's surface. So, is it true? Is the ferocious lion afraid of water? It's actually a myth. Lions enjoy taking a dip in the water because it allows them to cool off. This makes sense if you think about the climates the creatures have to face. Temperatures in a savanna climate range from 68 to 86 degrees Fahrenheit. You know all of us humans hit the beach whenever the weather is like that. So why should we expect anything different from the lion? Especially given that the creatures typically carry around between 280 and 420 pounds of weight as well as a thick coat of fur. The ironic thing about this whole lions are afraid of water myth is that they're actually fantastic swimmers. The same goes for all of your other favorite large cats from these warm weather climates, such as tigers, leopards, jaguars, and ocelots. It's actually large cats from cold climates that do their best to avoid water. This applies to such felines as bobcats, lynxes, and snow leopards. The latter lives in places like the cold alpine tundra biome. That's a rocky mountainous area. Temperatures there, on average, get as low as 33 degrees Fahrenheit. Again, it makes perfect sense that these big, cold weather cats despise water. Getting their fur coats wet would dampen their chances of staying warm, pun intended. I don't think you have to look too far to piece together where this lions are afraid of water myth comes from. In fact, 
there's a good chance for some of you watching this video that the reason is near your computer screen right now, jumping around and causing mischief. That's right, we may have jumped ourselves to a conclusion that certain behavioral aspects of our own pet cats would match that of a lion. House cats, though related to all the previously mentioned big cats, are not actually directly descended from them. They instead have developed over millions of years from a single wild ancestor that still exists in the wild today, the Near Eastern Wildcat. As water is not plentiful in the Middle East, these cats were not exposed to it to any great degree. Like their descendants, they only appreciate it as a food source. As you likely see with your pet, they hardly bathe, swim, or interact with water in general. Lucky for them, they don't even need to. These domestic felines use their tongues to clean themselves. They can do this because their tongues have tiny hook-shaped papillae. They assist cats in grooming out knots and keeping the coat clean, sweet-smelling, and in overall mm. immaculate shape. Cats, in general, are individualistic creatures. And you may be screaming at your screen right now proclaiming that your cat, in fact, loves water. And this is definitely possible. Some cats even like to play with water. For example, drips from the tap or bubbles in the bath. There are specific breeds of house cats that are known to enjoy the aqua life more than others. The Turkish Van, for example, which is also appropriately known as the swimming cat. It's believed that the breed developed an affinity for water by swimming in Lake Van to cool down. This lake is in the area the animals evolved from. Moving on to a problem a cat definitely doesn't have to deal with. Have you ever heard of musophobia, also known as suriphobia? Both words are valid names for a fear of mice and rats. There is a common belief that one particular animal that has this fear is the beautiful elephant. That's right, the same animal that, depending on the species, stands at the height of roughly 10 feet and weighs about 9,000 pounds. It's supposedly afraid of a creature that is a mere 4 inches in length and weighs less than one pound. But why did this belief appear? Well, the reasoning for this rumor is based on the possibility that elephants are paranoid about mice climbing inside their trunks. If a mouse succeeded in doing this, there would be a potential that it could cause irritation and blockage within the trunk. Now, I'm not trying to be the guy who spoils parties, but it looks like this belief is also a myth. Researchers claim that there's no concrete evidence that suggests elephants are afraid of mice. The most they'll concede is that the giant animal may sometimes take fright by the sudden appearance of the tiny rodent, which is the exact same for ourselves. Experts also claim that even if a mouse did get inside an elephant's trunk, the latter could effortlessly blow it back out with a puff of air. There's also some evidence that, in most cases, the animal remains unbothered by rodents and even allows mice to climb on their heads and trunks. Researchers are sure that as long as an elephant is healthy, there's no other animal that it fears simply because of its size. So, lions aren't afraid of water, elephants don't seem to be afraid of mice, then are any of these animal fear rumors real? Hmm. We're probably going to be left just as disappointed by asking if a bear has any legit fear, right? Well, ladies and gentlemen, please give a round of applause for none other than people's best friend. That's right, bears do feel quite uncomfortable whenever they are around dogs. And all this despite a very distant genetic link to them. When the two creatures encounter each other, the dog has the ability to chase, intimidate, corner, or antagonize the bear. As for the powerful animal, it will instead try to avoid any run-ins with the dog. There's even a type of Finnish dog breed known as the Karelian bear dog. This dog species is specifically used for standing up to large animals, such as bears. This dog has a great sense of direction, body flexibility, and control, courage, sense of smell, and persistence. So, does this mean you can walk with your dog through an area known to have bears and feel absolutely calm and confident because of the presence of your loyal companion? Not really. Despite the fact that bears may be nervous around dogs, we can't forget their size and power. The American black bear can reach a height of nearly 7 feet and weigh up to 660 pounds. 
If a mother bear has nowhere to run or feels that her cubs might be in danger, it's extremely possible that she will lash out, which can only mean big trouble for you or your dog. So, nobody should ever test this theory. Instead, if you're ever planning to visit an unknown area with your dog, you should first plan ahead and familiarize yourself with the wildlife you may encounter there. Because you never know what a bear will do when it notices you and your pooch, especially given their mild case of cynophobia, which is the name given to a fear of dogs. At least we were able to find one genuine fear of another animal out of these three tough members of the animal kingdom. Weird that a dog, something that gives so many of us such joy and comfort in our own homes, is still the creature that's brave enough to take on a bear if need be. Well, not all heroes wear capes. Some just wear fur and a dog collar. Why don't we take a look at what frightens these great companions of ours? Ever wondered why your own dog becomes uncomfortable when it hears loud noises? The degree of fear differs in each dog. But it's the simple unpredictability of thunder and flashing lightning, or loud bangs that accompany firework displays, that causes your dog uneasiness. The inability to understand what's causing this deafening noise may cause your dog to tremble, tuck its tail between its legs, or even run away from home. Another thing that can really frighten our loyal pets is when we leave them all alone by themselves. This can, unfortunately, lead to being a nightmare for your next-door neighbors because a common symptom of this fear is excessive barking. This fear may also cause problems closer to home. Ever asked yourself why your dog chewed up your sofa? Housebreaking accidents are typical when a dog has separation anxiety. You can't stay mad at your dog for long though, right? Your pooch will make it up to you when you guys run into a bear. So, we all know that Mother Nature is wise. If she blesses some creature with a particular body part, it should make perfect sense, right? Well, yeah, but still, some wildlife shots make you wonder if evolution has gone the wrong way. Snakes' natural design allows them to swallow a whole mouse. But in some cases, this cool ability can turn against them. Yes, snakes can actually swallow themselves. Scientists believe that they mostly do this because of stress, captivity, temperature regulation, hunger, or illness. The snake is pretty helpless in this situation, you can tell. If it doesn't get help in time, digestive juices may begin to corrode the swallow tail. So if you ever catch your pet snake doing this, try to stop it or take it to the vet. Okay, but what about the fangs, I hear you ask? Does a venomous snake have immunity to its own venom? Well, if the snake digests it, it will be okay. It's because protein is a primary component in venom. And besides, the venom is excreted by the gland in the snake's mouth. So no matter whom the snake bites, chances are that it's going to drink a bit. So the only way a snake can actually suffer from its own venom is by biting itself straight into the blood vessel. In this case, it'll experience the same reaction as any other animal. Now, think you're having a bad hair day? Hey, check this guy out. Chris was an Australian merino ram who became a celebrity in 2015 after being discovered in the wild. Farmers shorn him and gained nearly 90 pounds of wool. When the animal was found, he carried over five years' worth of fleece on his body. But Chris belonged to the domestic sheep breed that needs to be shorn regularly. Otherwise, the animal is at great risk of injury and infection. So the lives of these cuties depend directly on going to the hairdresser. Shall we talk about horns? Cattle, goats, and many other species proudly wear this fancy headdress not only for fashion, but also as a weapon for brutal battles. If you ask this bighorn sheep ram directly how old he is, you'll probably hear something like, bah. But if you want to get a more precise answer, you can count the number of rings on his horns. The biggest and the darkest ring usually marks the fourth birthday, when the ram matures enough for mating. Although animal horns may look very tough, in fact, most of them are made of keratin. It's the same protein that builds human hair and nails. Horns never stop growing as the animal ages, just like our own hair. And eventually, they can curl into really extravagant shapes, making these weapons turn against their owners. This is what a Wilshire sheep horn looks like when it's young. 
But as the years go by, the horns typically curl in front of its face. And while most grow out harmlessly, the inward-growing horns can end up dangerously close to the sheep's head. Like this ram who's having bad luck, to say the least. Its horn has slowly grown into its own skull, and eventually, well, it didn't end well for the sheep. Of course, this would hardly have happened on a farm, because people would have made a preventive horn cut. But unfortunately, in the wild, animals cannot use hairdresser services. That's why they use rocks and branches to rub and grind away at their horns to keep them safe, just like humans trim their nails. Faulty genetics is not the only reason for the horn distortion. You see, when males of this species want to fight for dominance, they begin to butt heads to show each other who's the alpha male here. Mm -hmm. These battles can break horn plates, making them grow at weird and dangerous angles. The fancier the original shape of the horns is, the more problems their fracture may cause. This poor African kudu is a bright example. Fortunately, in some cases, unlimited body part growth can be good for the animal. Just take a look at these adorable smiles. If you happen to break off your own molar tooth, your dentist would probably say it's irreversible and offer a replacement. But if an alpaca breaks its front teeth, all it has to do is wait a bit. Although these animals don't have upper teeth, their lower teeth constantly grow throughout their lifetime. And they might look pretty creepy when they get too long. That's why some farmers prefer trimming them from time to time. Just like pet owners cut the nails of their cats or dogs. Now llamas look so similar to alpacas that many people confuse these two species. But the significant difference between them is that llamas' front teeth are encased in enamel. That's why, unlike alpacas, they don't possess the superpower of limited growth. Eh, too bad. Unlike the keratin horns, deer antlers are made entirely of bone. Typically, only male deers, called stags, grow antlers. Very rarely, females can grow them too due to a serious hormone imbalance. This is a deer equivalent of a beard on a human female that sometimes can appear due to various diseases. Adult deers grow and shed their antlers annually, which coincides with the breeding season. At first, their antlers are covered in velvet, a protective skin with blood vessels. But once the antler is fully developed, the deer gets rid of the velvet, just like snakes shed their skin. Although this process doesn't harm the deer, it may look pretty spooky. Once the brand new antlers are ready, stags begin to fight with other males over the ladies' attention. Usually stags barely eat or sleep during this competition. And if you ever question whether the antlers of two deers can get locked together, the answer is yes. Every stag is risking ending up stuck with his own rival instead of having a romantic night out with a female deer. Bummer. Moreover, all the traumas that the deer gets during the mating season can influence further antler growth if specific nerves get damaged. Just like horns, antlers can develop at distorted angles because of genetic failures. Some mutations can even make them grow monstrously large. This unlucky deer can barely move his head without losing balance. Also, if a deer breaks one of its legs, its body can speed up the healing by sacrificing the bone and blood material from one of the antlers. And thus, this antler will get thinner and weaker. And speaking of facial extensions, we cannot skip the tusks. Please meet Babarusa from Indonesia. This ancient boar first emerged over 35,000 years ago. It's easy to confuse these big tusks with horns, but they are actually upper canines. They tend to pierce through the skin of the boar's face as it matures. Scientists believe that these intimidating tusks have evolved as a tool to protect eyes and throat while fighting with other males during mating season. But this design doesn't seem very thoughtful. If a male boar doesn't grind his tusk regularly, they can end up curling back into his own skull, which can blind him or even worse. Now, what if I told you that hoofs can grow out of control just like horns and antlers? It took evolution millions of years to turn the middle toe of the animal's foot bone into the hoof. And just like toenails, they tend to grow and curl into creepy shapes if they aren't cut regularly. When donkeys or horses don't have a chance to wear down their hooves naturally by walking on hard surfaces, they tend to overgrow. 
This makes the animals walk on the balls of their feet and overstretch the tendons, which may result in pain and bone loss. And eventually, they can lose the ability to walk at all. So if you ever come across a horse with curly hooves, consider calling the experts to give it an emergency manicure. Perhaps one of the most obvious questions regarding the undersea world is, can a fish drown in the water? Yup, it can. Although gills are an amazing gift of nature, there are still many factors that may deprive a fish of healthy breathing. When the oxygen level in the water is too low, fish begin to suffocate. But it happens very rarely in the wild. Oxygen deficit usually appears in aquariums that are not washed and replenished often enough. Also, parasites, diseases, and an overall imbalance in water components can cause the fish to drown. And on that note, I need to hoof it on out of here. See you next time! Did you know that animals see the world differently from us? Take this. Pigeons actually have better vision than humans. Crazy, right? So let's try to see the world from the animal's eyes. Let's start with snakes. Their way of seeing the world is totally different from ours. They have special infrared-sensitive receptors in their snouts. This allows them to see the radiated heat of warm-blooded mammals. Now let's move on to cows. These big guys don't see colors as well as humans do. They can't see the color red because they don't have the necessary receptors in their retinas for that. So they only perceive variations of blue and green. Also, they don't like it when someone approaches them from behind. They have a near panoramic vision and the only area they can't see is directly to the back. So if you're ever sneaking up on a cow, make sure you give them a heads up. Horses have a blind spot right in front of their faces because of their eye placement. This means they can't see things directly in front of them. Also, they don't see as many colors as we do. Just like cows, their world is mostly made up of greens, yellows, and blues. Poor guys. Fish eyes have ultraviolet receptors and a more spherical lens than humans. This gives them an almost 360 degree vision. As for colors, they're able to see all the same ones as we humans do. But because light behaves differently underwater, they have a hard time discerning red and its shades. Deep sea fish can easily see in the dark, which is pretty cool. Sharks, on the other hand, can't distinguish colors at all, but they see much clearer under the water than we do. Birds have some pretty unique ways of seeing the world. Unlike humans, birds can see ultraviolet light. This helps them differentiate between males and females of their own species, as well as better navigate in their surroundings. Also, they are very good at focusing. For example, falcons and eagles can focus on a small mouse in the field up to a distance of one mile. A pigeon can see all the tiny details. So if you ever need to find a crack in the pavement, just ask a pigeon. And by the way, it has a 340 degree field of vision, and generally their vision is considered twice as good as a human's. There, you have it. I'm envious of a pigeon. Insects have some weird vision patterns too. Flies, for example, have thousands of little eye receptors that work together to give them a big picture of what's going on around them. And get this, they see everything in slow-mo. Plus, they can see ultraviolet light. It helps them with communication. Bees have their own problems. These guys can't tell what the color red is. To them, it looks like a dark blue. How messed up is that? Now, rats. These little guys can't see red either, but that's not the weirdest part. Either of their eyes moves on its own, so they're seeing double, like all the time. It's a wonder they don't run into more walls, am I right? Cats don't see shades of red or green, but they do see brown, yellow, and blue hues like a boss. Plus, they got a wide-angle view, so they can peep more stuff on the sides than we can. There's more, though. When it's pitch black outside, cats become ninja-like and can see six times better than us. Their pupils adjust to any lighting like magic. Now let's talk about dogs. These furry friends can't see red or orange, but they do rock at blue and violet. Plus, they can differentiate 40 shades of gray. I mean, it's not 50, but still impressive. On a related note, frogs are really picky eaters. They won't even bother with food that isn't moving. They could be surrounded by a buffet of delicious bugs, but if they don't wiggle, frogs won't even bat an eye, and they're not the most observant creatures either. If something isn't important to them, like a shadow, they won't even bother looking at it. Chameleons have eyes that can move independently of each other, so they can see everything around them without even turning their heads. They can even see two images at the same time, 
like a double feature movie, one in front and one behind. Pretty impressive, right? What would you do if you suddenly got 360 degree vision like a chameleon? Share in the comments. So Megalodon was one of the biggest and most ferocious monsters on our planet. Powerful jaws, razor sharp teeth, gigantic eyes. But what do you know about how it sounded? Imagine how loudly it growled, permeating the underwater world with sound vibrations. This sound resembled eh, nothing. Megalodon didn't have a voice. It was a shark, and sharks don't have sound-producing organs. It was a quiet danger. But despite its muteness, yes, that is a word, you could have still heard it. Come with me. Now you're underwater, clenching your fist, raising your hand, and quickly bringing it down. Now imagine that you have a big submarine instead of a fist, and hear the water flowing around the smooth surface of the hull. That's what a megalodon sounded like. When this monster was swimming out to the surface and opening its jaws, it sounded like a waterfall. The giant shark swam at high speed. When the water was passing through its mouth and gills, it sounded like a flowing river, a fast, powerful river. Megalodon had no voice, only the scary sound of flowing water. Other ancient fish could make sounds, but you would hardly hear them. Whales, dolphins, and their distant ancestors are not counted because they're mammals. Fish communicated at frequencies elusive to human ears. They still have this ability, but in most, the ocean was and is a pretty quiet place. So let's get out on ancient lands and check what was going on with the sounds there. Thanks to modern technologies, scientists can analyze the sounds of many ancient animals. Using CT scans, they found that some dinosaurs had complex systems of small open pockets in their skulls. They used these winding cranial mazes to reproduce a wide range of sounds and regulate body temperature. And people have managed to hear them. An ancient bird that lived 79 to 140 million years ago, Vegasus, sounded similar to some farm birds like duck and geese. But the ancient creature probably screamed in a scarier way. Scientists found this out thanks to the Srinx fossil they discovered in 2016 in Antarctica. It's the oldest known vocal organ in the world. It helped Vegasus make a double humming sound coming from the left and right sides of the Srinx. Imagine a duck and goose screaming. Increase the volume several times. Perhaps that's what its distant ancestors sound like. As for other flying reptiles like the pterodactyl, it couldn't scream like Vegasus because it didn't have a syrinx. These winged monsters could growl, hiss, and snap their beaks, and this was their most effective sound. Remember any tall basketball player? The skull of the pterodactyl was slightly longer than their height. Just imagine what a noise the dinosaur created when it was snapping its powerful beak. The clicking sound could deafen and frighten other ancient creatures nearby. Now, you probably know what a Tyrannosaurus sounds like, thanks to the movies. Among thousands of others, you'll recognize this prolonged roar similar to a chainsaw vacuum cleaner and horn. And honestly, its roar has a lot in common with the natural sounds that this monster could make. Thanks to modern technologies and well-preserved remains, scientists managed to simulate the voice of these ancient animals. Imagine you're uploading data about a T-Rex into a program and preparing to hear an intimidating roar. You press play, and it sounds like a bee. Tyrannosaurus rex's scream was similar to birds, not mammals. But it wasn't just a bee. It used nostrils to scream, not a mouth. The hum came from the chest and resembled a siren with low bass. Maybe it sounded a lot more intimidating than what we saw in the movies. It was louder than all the trumpets of the symphony orchestra, and it did it only with the help of its nose. It's not known for sure whether it could growl through the mouth. You could also hear how long-necked dinosaurs sounded in the movies. Their calls were similar to those of elephants, something between a saxophone and a car horn. But in fact, these tall creatures whispered. Almost all mammals make sounds thanks to the laryngeal nerve. This nerve runs down along the neck, then goes around the blood vessels of the chest and comes back to the larynx. In short, the brain gives a signal and it passes twice the distance along the body before the sound is released from the mouth. And now, remember those long necks of dinosaurs? This was the height of a five-story building. 
but the voice signal had to run a distance of 10 floors. It took too long to make this long trip, and this affected the dinosaur's roar. So when they wanted to make a sound, they just hissed. And it was probably similar to the sound of a giant viper. But the most detailed sounds scientists have managed to get belongs to the Parasaur Olaphus. You know this herbivorous dinosaur thanks to the long crest on the back of its head. We saw the dinosaur using it in movies and documentaries to fight opponents and enemies. Some scientists believed it also used the comb to drop fruits and leaves from trees. Others thought the dinosaur used it to improve its sense of smell. But it turned out that in addition to self-defense and fighting, they used the comb to make loud and scary sounds in different keys. Scientists replicated this with fantastic accuracy, thanks to the structure of its hard tissues. Almost all living beings with a voice use soft organs to make sounds. And these soft tissues decompose quickly. Parasar olifus had solid ones. They noticed tubes leading from the nostrils to the crest and back to the nostrils when they found the skull. It was like a crumb horn, a curved musical wind instrument. This proved the dinosaur used the crest on the back of its head to make the sounds louder. The comb allowed it to trumpet so its relatives could hear it in the forest. They made humming sounds with low and high notes. Mix a saxophone and trumpet with a goose hum, car horns, and low frequencies, then increase the volume several times. That's what Parasar Olaphus sounded like. That's also what my fourth grade band sounded like. But I digress. You can listen to different shades and timbers of this dinosaur on the internet. It used noises with different tones to create complex social connections. They could communicate, identify each other, trumpet danger, or conversely, signal their friendly intentions. Alright, we've just heard how some ancient reptiles sounded. But what about ancient insects? They didn't have vocal cords, of course. Instead, they used friction between body parts. Look at modern crickets chirping with their wings. One wing has tiny notches. The second has the shape of a mediator. Take a simple plastic comb and run your fingertip over its teeth. Crickets make their sounds by the same principle. Their wings vibrate and release a series of sound waves into the air. But the clicking of an ancient bush cricket was very different from modern insects since they were much noisier. The sounds of these clicks were like a whistle. With the help of high-frequency waves, they could also communicate secretly as if they were doing it through a closed radio channel. If you heard this, you would hardly be able to fall asleep to it. Now, modern crickets are not so loud, as they began to add more high frequencies to their sounds. Higher pitch waves don't spread as far, reducing the risk that a bat will hear the insects. Just imagine how the jungle of that time sounded. The loud chirping of crickets hurts the ears. Then you hear a brachiosaurus hissing. The clicks of pterodactyls shake the sky like thunderclaps. Then you hear the trumpet sounds of different tones somewhere in the jungle. These are Parasar olifus communicating with each other. And then you get scared by a loud Tyrannosaurus siren. What a racket! You'd probably not find peace in such conditions. Fortunately, humans appeared millions of years later. And by the way, scientists have managed to find out and understand what our distant ancestors sounded like. They carefully examined the insert function of the mouth, nose, and throat on the Neanderthal skeleton. Their voices were similar to ours, but the phonetic range of an adult Neanderthal was the same as if they were two to three years old. It was like mumbling without consonant sounds. The study of the skull couldn't recreate precisely the sound of Neanderthals. But in 2007, scientists extracted DNA samples from their bones. They found a variation of the gene that responds to human speech. Scientists believe that Neanderthals fought with Homo sapiens. You know, our family tree. As a result of this conflict, their kind became extinct. But the found gene points they could have had other connections with each other. Perhaps Neanderthals could understand their language and even pronounce some words. Alright, you're scuba diving in the ocean watching corals and colorful fish flitting by. When suddenly, an enormous shadow appears above you. You look up and see a massive creature approaching you, its mouth a gaping abyss. Relax, just stay still and you'll be fine. This leviathan is a basking shark, one of the scary sea monsters 
that isn't really capable of doing harm to anyone. Basking sharks are filter feeders, just like baleen whales. They open their large mouths to swallow plankton and don't even have teeth. It's late night in the Central American jungle. You're out in the wild to watch birds, and you hear flapping of wings. Excited, you look intently into your night vision goggles, only to see a face out of your worst nightmares. Ah, don't scream, you'll scare it away! It's a perfectly harmless, wrinkle-faced bat, and it isn't interested in you. These are fruit bats, and wrinkles on their faces allow them to collect fruit pieces and juice for later snacks. By the way, their Latin name, Centuro Senex, was given to them for their semblance to 100-year-old humans. Walking around a Nepali National Park and deciding to wash your face in the river nearby, you freeze in terror. A crocodile is looking straight at you from no more than a few feet's distance. Then it raises its snout above the water and you exhale in relief. It's a gharial. These reptiles have long and narrow snouts that allow them to efficiently catch fish and, at the same time, prohibiting them from hunting any other prey. While still carnivores, gharials are pretty shy and will slither away at the sight of humans. Right now, there are no more than a thousand of these crocodilians in the whole world. So let it go. Especially if it's a girl gharial. <laughs> You dig your garden in the backyard and notice something moving on your shovel. You take a closer look and drop the tool in horror. A small creature looking like a hostile alien is scurrying away into some burrow in the ground. Eh, no worries. It's just a star-nosed mole. These critters have peculiar snouts that look like they've been blown up from within. Their eyes are small and weak, so the star on their nose helps them a lot to move around and seek food. It's always on the move, touching everything it can reach as if the tendrils were tiny fingers. Oh, you're bathing in the ocean again! Well, look to your right, there's a real toothed shark going right at you! Nah, don't panic! It's just a sand tiger shark. Neither a sand nor a tiger one, it's a vulnerable fish-eating shark that slowly swims in the seas and chases its prey from time to time. There have been no reports of it ever attacking humans. But it still has rows of sharp teeth, so don't try to touch it just in case. It may seem placid, but you don't want it to get a bite out of you, do you? Okay, from ocean to desert, you're in Australia and longing for some water. You see a likely spot and start digging the ground only to stumble upon a creature straight from the depths of neither, all covered in thorns. It eyes you suspiciously and slinks away because it's just a thorny devil. Despite its ominous name, this lizard is harmless to humans. Horn-like bumps on its skin are for protection from predators and birds of prey. The thorns are hard, but as long as you don't touch them, you're fine. Now, if you have arachnophobia, it won't calm you down. But tailless whip scorpions you might meet in North and South America, as well as Asia and Africa, are more afraid of you than you are of them. Eh, Tell yourself that. These nightmarish creatures don't have stingers and won't even bite when threatened. The worst they could do, and only if you corner them, why would you do that, is prick you with their front legs, leaving tiny puncture marks on your finger. Many people even keep them as pets, and they're quite affectionate toward their owners. Yeah. If you ever stumble upon a burrow from which a hairless, big-toothed creature is speaking at you, just don't mind it and let it be. Naked mole rats are the sphinx cats among rodents. They're close relatives of mole rats, but, well, naked. And they're fascinating in their own right, too, thanks to living entirely underground. They're almost totally cold-blooded, but can conform to any temperature outside. And their flappy, wrinkled skin doesn't feel any pain at all. So pins and prickles, as well as sharp teeth, don't scare naked mole rats. You're once again lost in the jungle, this time on Madagascar. Poor you. The night has fallen, and you seek shelter. But when you think you've found a suitable tree to build a lean-to, you freeze in terror. A black, long-fingered hand appears on a tree branch right above you and two huge yellow eyes are staring you down. 
Then you see a shaggy face and realize it's just a lemur. An eye-eye, more precisely. This creature is native to Madagascar and only goes out at night, so you're lucky to see it. It fulfills a role of a woodpecker in tropical forests. It knocks on tree trunks to find bugs and uses its long, wizened fingers to reach inside. Tired of being scared? You seek your way home, but your horrors aren't over yet. There's a big red and white snake across your path. It hisses and lies in wait for you to move. You know it's a coral snake, a really dangerous, venomous kind. You stop in your tracks, and only when it finally slithers away, you realize it was actually a milk snake. They often mimic venomous ones, not only coral snakes, to protect themselves from predators. Still, if you're not a snake expert, it's always best to stay away. Okay, this creature will infest your darkest dreams. A giant African millipede. It's big, it's glossy black, and it has hundreds of tiny crawly legs. And yet, if it had googly eyes, it could even be cute. Perhaps that's why so many people keep them as pets. That, and because they commonly live up to 10 years. Giant millipedes can't really bite. Their only defense is curling into a tight ball and secreting irritating liquid from the pores of its skin. If you dare touch it, don't rub your eyes or nose afterwards. It's quite unpleasant. Goliath Bird Eater is another popular pet creepy crawler. It isn't dangerous for humans, despite it looking like your worst nightmare. This is one of the largest spiders in the world, and as its name implies, it sometimes hunts small birds for food. But they aren't part of its regular diet. The spider prefers worms and amphibians. Make sure you don't frighten it, though. It can still bite or release hairs in self-defense. The bite is similar to a wasp sting, and hairs can cause severe irritation on your skin. But mostly, this gentle giant is just shy and will crawl away at the sight of you. Oh dear, there's another snake approaching you, and fast! You're about to turn and run when you see a hulking eight-legged form cutting into the snake's path and leaping on it. It's another arachnid, and it looks even more terrifying than the snake. It's a camel spider. Not really a spider, nor a scorpion. These creatures belong to a separate family. They became the stuff of many urban legends, but in fact, they don't even have any venom. Sure, they can bite, and their jaws are pretty powerful, but camel spiders can't do much more to a human than just bite. They hide in the sand and burrow to leap on unsuspecting lizards, invertebrates, and yes, even snakes. And now, picture a pill bug. Not exactly a beauty, but since it's small, it's okay. But what if it were 10 times as large? No, definitely not okay. Still, such a creature exists, and it's a giant isopod. Thankfully, it lurks in deep, dark, and cold waters, so it won't ever come up in your backyard. Giant isopods grow to such enormous size because of something called deep-sea gigantism. Deep-dwelling creatures have to endure great pressure of water, extreme cold temperatures, and scarce food, so their metabolism slows down. Isopods don't move much, and more often than not, just lie in wait until some poor small bug or crustacean crawls within their reach and they can munch on it. And though it looks like a many-legged chaos from below, a giant isopod can hurt you even if it wanted to. Just pet it already. Lions, dogs, cats, all these mammals sleep in pretty comfortable positions. But not whales. They look like giant floating loaves of bread, which is a scene one diver accidentally came across in the Caribbean Sea. Six whales were just standing upright with their tails pointed down at a depth of about 65 feet below the surface. Scientists discovered that when sperm whales take a nap, they stay in this position for 10 to 15 minutes. They don't move or breathe. But these creatures spend only 7% of their time asleep, far less than other mammals. Usually, they either rest peacefully in the water or relax, slowly swimming next to other marine animals. When they're moving and sleeping at the same time, they're actually taking a nap. These animals can't go too deep and need to stay close to the surface. Great white sharks sleep and hunt at greater depths, which means one less thing to worry about when taking a quick nap. 
Plus, it gets pretty cold the deeper you go. And whales need warmer environments that can help them maintain the temperature of their large bodies. When alone, dolphins enter a stage of deep sleep. It usually happens at night and lasts for only a few hours at a time. While sleeping, the animal floats at the surface. It shuts down half of its brain, I can relate, together with the opposite eye. The other half is at a low alert level, awake and ready to react if some unwanted visitor comes closer. The part of the brain that is awake also sends signals when it's time to go up to the surface to take a breath of fresh air. Marine mammals have the blowhole. That's a flap of skin they can open and close whenever they want. People breathe automatically. Your body knows what it needs to do even when you're sleeping. But whales and dolphins have a voluntary breathing system. It means they need to consciously go to the surface to get some air. And one part of their brain needs to always be awake to inform the animal it's time to go up. Whales and dolphins can hold their breath way longer than other species. They also have a higher tolerance for carbon dioxide and can take in more air. Their red blood cells store more oxygen, too. Whales and dolphins' blood goes only to those body parts that really need oxygen. If a whale only uses its brain, heart, fins, and some other muscles needed for swimming at the moment, those will also be the only body parts that will get the oxygen. Digestion or other functions can wait. The ocean is not a place where you can relax and peacefully fall asleep. While sleeping, fish reduce their activity. Their metabolism becomes slow. Some of them keep floating in the same spot. Others find a safer place among corals or in the mud. Early in life, dolphins learn to make a unique whistle that helps others from their pod to identify them. That means these specific whistles are their names, and dolphins do respond to them. Clams have feet. It looks like a large tongue that sometimes protrudes from the shell, but that's actually the foot. And it's relatively long compared to the length of the animal. Clams use this limb to dig themselves in the sand. The blue whale is the largest living animal, and it's also larger than the majority of dinosaurs used to be. They can grow to more than 100 feet long and have a weight of almost 200 tons. That's like 50 adult elephants. A blue whale's tongue alone can weigh more than one elephant. Such a giant surely needs to eat a lot, half a million calories in just one mouthful. The blue whale's heart is the size of a small car and weighs 1,300 pounds. To move the blood through such a giant body, the heartbeats are so strong you can hear them even from 2 miles away. The heart of a whale beats only 8 to 10 times per minute. The whale is one of the loudest creatures out there. Its call can go up to 180 decibels, which is as loud as a jet plane. Almost 95% of jellyfish's body is made of water. For comparison, the human body is 60% water. It's probably not a surprise since jellyfish don't have a heart, blood, eyes, or brain. The other 5% of their body weight is proteins, muscles, and nerve cells. Jellyfish have been around for more than 500 million years. This makes them older than dinosaurs. These creatures haven't changed much, and today's jellyfish are pretty much like their ancestors. These creatures live in the ocean, but in 1991, more than 2,000 jellyfish polyps were taken into space. Scientists wanted to see how they would react in the environment with no gravity. The jellyfish reproduced and created 60,000 new polyps. But unfortunately, those couldn't function normally after getting back to Earth. One species of jellyfish can literally live forever. As it grows older, the critter goes down to the seafloor to become a polyp again. And that polyp turns into a new jellyfish with the same genetics. Greenland sharks can live 500 years. This is an animal with almost the longest lifespan among vertebrates. Sperm whales are sociable creatures. They spend their life surrounded by their family. These animals support one another and have close friends they remember well, even if they don't see each other for a long time. Electric eels have small eyes that are not so effective in environments with no light, so they mostly rely on their electric organs. Those consist of 6,000 cells. Eels use them to stow power, similar to batteries. These creatures use electricity like bats use their radars or dolphins their sonar. An eel can also produce enough electricity to power a panel of light bulbs. 
there's a small tropical archer fish that can learn to recognize human faces. This fish has an interesting ability to spit small jets of water from its mouth. Researchers showed the fish the image of two different faces placed side by side. One was unknown, and the other was familiar. The fish was supposed to spit water at the familiar one. The creature took the right guess more than 80% of the time. Every year in the winter, great white sharks that live along the California coastline disappear. It feels as if they take a vacation for 30 to 40 days. The animals go to a point halfway between Hawaii and Mexico. They might do it to get some food, relax, or hang out with their buddies from other areas. The spot is now called the Whale Shark Cafe. Some types of sharks, like makos, whale sharks, or white sharks, breathe in a very specific way. It requires them to swim all the time. They also need to move quickly and with their mouth open. This way, the oxygen can enter and reach their gills. Sea sponges are some of the most primitive animals. They're immobile, don't have a mouth, eyes, bones, brain, heart, lungs, or any other organ whatsoever. And still, they're alive. There's such a thing as a sea unicorn. That's an animal called the narwhal. Its horn is actually a tooth that can grow up to 10 feet long. Manatees, also known as sea cows, are distant relatives of elephants. Their weight can go up to 1,000 pounds. These creatures are vegetarian and need to eat around 10% of their total weight on a daily basis. That's lots of sea salad. In some cases, manatees share space with alligators, but they get along pretty well. You can even find a photo from Florida where an alligator rides a manatee's back. Frogfish have special fins that help these creatures walk along the sand. They're very useful in shallow waters. A ghost pipefish is hard to see, but once you spot it, you're bound to get really surprised. Its head makes up over 40% of its body. Crabs don't feel like wasting time on such formalities as putting foods in their mouth. That's why they taste it with their feet, which is where their taste buds are. Marine iguanas are the only lizards on our planet that like spending time in the ocean, even though they mainly live on land. They're herbivores that feed in shallow waters and swim like snakes. Iguanas use their long claws to hold on to the bottom when they need to graze. Green turtles can cross over 1,400 miles when migrating. They try to find the perfect spot to lay their eggs. Penguins sort of fly when they're underwater, reaching a speed of 25 miles per hour. More than 5 million years ago, I've heard, I wasn't around then, deep sea worms and humans had a common ancestor. So we still share 70% of our genes with these creatures, and with sea stars, squid, and octopuses. The ocean covers over 70% of our planet, and over 80% of it is unexplored. More than 1 million species live there. But there are not only animals. 3 million shipwrecks are lying all over the ocean floor, hiding mysterious stories. Many of them are yet to be discovered. Now, sloths can hold their breath longer than dolphins. Yep, incredible but true. They slow their heart rate so much, they can stay under the surface for up to 40 minutes. Unlike fish, dolphins and whales are aquatic mammals, which means they can't breathe underwater. When it comes to breathing, they're more similar to us than the fish. Both of them have lungs, and they breathe air through something we know as a blowhole. When they're under the surface, they hold their breath until they come up for some air again. Dolphins can stay under the water for 10 minutes. A sperm whale can hold its breath for 90 minutes, while an elephant seal holds the record when it comes to aquatic mammals and can stay under the water for 2 hours without having to go up. There's a wasp so tiny, much tinier than its name, it's smaller than an amoeba, even though amoebas are made of one cell only. You can see this wasp has the same body parts as the rest of the bugs – wings, brain, eyes, and the rest – but it's really a tiny version of an insect, since it's only eight thousandths of an inch long. And the smallest adult insect we know of is a parasitic wasp with a big name, also known as the fairy fly. Their males don't have wings, they're blind and only five thousandths of an inch long. Now, it's no coincidence each animal species has different colors and patterns. 
One of the reasons for that is to help them stand out when looking for their potential mating partners or to send a warning to predators they're poisonous and hope they get the message right. Then there are ambush predators, such as tigers. It's very important for them to remain invisible because the difference is huge. If their prey sees them before they get there, no dinner that night. But why exactly are tigers orange? For us, orange is a color used for things that need to be ultra-visible. For example, items such as safety vests or traffic cones. To the human eye, orange will mostly stand out in the environment. So if there's a tiger coming for you, you'll spot it relatively easily. But humans have so-called trichromatic color vision. When light from your surroundings enters your eye, it hits the retina, a thin layer located in the back. To process that light, the retina uses two kinds of light receptors, rods and cones. Rods can only distinguish differences in light and darkness. They can't sense color. Our eyes will mostly rely on rods in dim light. Cones are in charge of color perception. Humans mostly have three types. Cones for green, blue, and red. That's exactly why we call our vision trichromatic. Most humans see three primary colors, together with their colorful combinations. Apes and some monkeys also have such a style of vision. But most mammals that live on land, including cats, horses, deer, and dogs, have dichromatic color vision. Retinas in their eyes have cones for two colors only, green and blue. When humans get information from their green and blue cones only, they're considered colorblind since they can't, for example, tell the difference between green and red shades. This is similar with mammals that live on land. Deer are surely tigers' prey way more than humans, and deer don't see tigers as orange, but green. Green tigers would surely be more difficult to spot, which would mean more dinner for tigers. But evolution still decided to go with orange because it's simply easier to produce such a color. The only green mammal is a sloth, but its fur is not naturally green. It's because of the algae that grows in it, and they can hold their breath for 40 minutes. The water around the poles can get very cold during certain periods of the year. There's plenty of fish that live there, but when that happens, they need to swim away to survive. But there's a special group of fish native to the Southern Ocean near Antarctica. The temperatures there are from 28 to 39 degrees Fahrenheit. Technically, that's below freezing, but all those dissolved salts in the seawater don't allow it to freeze over. And these fish can survive because they have a special feature called glycoprotein. It helps them stay in their home because it acts as sort of a natural antifreeze. It's a protein that prevents all those ice crystals from forming in their blood and helps it continue to flow normally. Have you ever wondered how tiny animals like ants breathe? Try to open your mouth and throat, but at the same time, hold your chest and diaphragm still. The diaphragm is a muscular structure that separates the chest and abdominal cavities in all mammals. It expands as you breathe. If you can't do this, you can't hold your breath, because oxygen will still find its way into your lungs. At least, enough of it to keep up with your body's demands. But generally, when you breathe, diaphragm is actively pumping air in and out of your body. To survive without the diaphragm doing so, you'd need more than one throat and a way smaller body. Now, ants have 9 or 10 pairs of openings along the sides of their tiny bodies. They're called spiracles, and each is connected to branching series of tubes. It's a system similar to human lungs. Their blood doesn't carry oxygen from those tubes to the rest of the body. Instead, the tubes spread this oxygen. The endings of these branches directly touch the membranes of their cells. This can only work in really small animals. When the body is bigger than 8 tenths of an inch, these tubes are too long, so they can't diffuse air fast enough. There are a couple of reasons why giraffes have long necks, which, by the way, can grow up to be 6.5 feet long. From first glance, it seems evolution gave them those to reach the sweetest topmost leaves of the trees. It's exclusive access other animals can only dream of, so giraffes don't have to compete for the best bites. But over time, researchers realized it's not the only reason. They also think the neck could be a good factor when male giraffes go into combat. 
the same as male antelopes will use their prongs or when a stag uses its antlers. The thicker the neck, the bigger the chances to win the combat. Some insects play possum when there's a predator nearby. For instance, in one research, scientists have observed an antlion larva insect. It played possum for 61 minutes. How does this even help? Well, let's say you're in a garden where you see a bunch of identical bushes with soft fruit. You go to the first bush and start collecting and eating fruits. Mmm, yummy! It's so simple! And you're doing it relatively fast. But as you strip that bush, it's getting harder for you to find more fruits. Plus, it's kind of irritating because it takes way more time now than at the beginning. So now you need to decide whether to stay there and try to find more, or simply switch to another bush to have it all easy and fast once again. Assuming you are the predator, and predators are greedy, you'll just look for ways to eat as much fruit as possible in the shortest period of time. This means you'll go on and start collecting fruits from another bush, and the next one, and so on. Researchers use the same logic when it comes to bird and antlion larvae. It appears that insects waste the predator's time when playing possum, which has a significant impact on how things go later. That way, they encourage the predator to look for food elsewhere, because the predator doesn't have that much time to waste. So, pretending to be not alive is actually a good way to stay alive. Depending on the species, young birds spend from 10 to 30 days in their eggs. There's no air inside, but Mother Nature created a perfect mechanism for them to still be able to breathe. As a young chick is developing inside the egg, it grows some kind of hollow sac-like structure from the gut. It's like a tiny pouch that fuses with a second membrane that goes around the chick and its yolk. So one end is attached to the chick, while the other is close to the inner surface of the eggshell. That way, this special membrane acts like lung tissue and connects the outside world with the chick's circulatory system. Most animals have two eyes, but some species need more. For example, some reptiles, amphibians, and fish have a third eye on top of the head. It's not something that improves their vision that much, but it simply helps them navigate via the sunlight and regulate their body temperature. Many invertebrates have more than two eyes. Most spiders have eight of them, because that way they can spot their prey easier. Squirrels' teeth never stop growing, but the animals wear them down by gnawing on nuts and other hard foods. The front of the rodent's teeth is actually orange. It's because they're covered in special tough enamel. Bet you're glad you don't have that to deal with. Some bird species don't mind munching on chili peppers. That's because they can't feel the heat. Peppers burn your mouth because they contain a special chemical, capsaicin. But birds don't have the taste buds needed to feel its effects. The rhino's horn is made of hair, or at least the same protein that makes up your hair and nails. This protein is called keratin. Such a horn is kind of unique since other animals have horns with a bony center. The woodpecker can peck the wood 20 times per second. This pace is almost too high for the human eye to notice. How much wood would a woodpecker peck if a woodpecker could peck wood? The number of pecks often reaches a total of 8,000 to 12,000 a day. A starfish does have eyes one on the end of each of its arms. These eyes are light-sensitive groups of cells. Frogs don't need to drink water. Instead, they have an area known as the drinking patch. It's on their bellies and thighs. They use it to absorb water directly through the skin. Well, that could save some time. Most caterpillar species have around 4,000 muscles in their body, and almost 250 of them are in the head alone. Christmas tree worms are much more beautiful than you can imagine. But even though the pines look awesome, two-thirds of the worm's body is hidden in a calcium carbonite tube. And the point of this is… I don't have one. Narwhals' famous tusks are actually their teeth that are kind of turned inside out. These unicorns of the sea have just two teeth. And in males, one of them grows right through their upper lip. Unlike your teeth. This one is tough inside and sensitive and soft on the outside. The anteater doesn't have teeth, but it's not a problem. This creature has a super long tongue. 
This tongue helps the animal lap up more than 35,000 termites and ants every day. Now well, that's one way to lick hunger. The flea can jump more than 200 times their body length. If humans had such an ability, they would jump as high as the Empire State Building. Woohoo! The red-eyed tree frog's eggs can hatch earlier if they sense their environment isn't safe. Small animals with fast metabolism see in slow-mo. This helps them escape larger creatures. Koala's fingerprints are very, very similar to the human ones. Sometimes these animals' fingerprints even get confused at crime scenes, probably in Australia. The hippo's sweat is pink and not exactly sweat. It's a reddish, oily fluid. Its function is to not cool the body, but to moisturize the skin and protect it. This fluid also functions as an antibiotic. So, you get sunburn or cut, you can smear a hippo all over you. Polar bear skin is black, and the hairs of their coat are hollow and almost see-through. These animals have fur growing even on the bottom of their paws. This gives them a better grip on ice and protects against cold. Some species of tarantulas, some of the largest spiders in the world, can live without food for more than two years. I still think they're creepy. Platypuses close their eyes while kissing, uh, I mean swimming. They have special folds of skin covering their ears and eyes. They prevent water from getting inside. These animals' nostrils also have a watertight seal. Emus can't walk backwards, but scientists aren't sure why. These flightless birds are the only ones that have calf muscles. Emus can sprint really fast. They can also travel long distances, but they can't back up. Crocodiles can't move their tongue because it's attached to the mouth roof. It keeps the throat closed and protects the animal's airway. Water snakes, dolphins, whales, alligators, crocodiles, and turtles can drown. It'll happen if they stay underwater for too long. These animals can't breathe in the water. They can just hold their breath for a very long time. Only one species of birds can fly backwards. That's hummingbirds. Hey, go talk to the emu. These tiny birds can also beat their wings up to 80 times per second. Despite what elephant shrews look like, these small animals are more closely related to elephants than shrews. Maybe that's why they have their trademark trunk-like noses. Elephant shrews use them to munch on insects. True enough. Cats, as well as other felines, can't taste sweet things. They don't have the taste buds needed for that. Too bad, more for me. Flamingos can only eat with their heads upside down. That's why their lower bill is massive and their upper bill isn't fixed. Such an arrangement is perfect for upside-down feeding. But it's the opposite of what other birds have. It's not easy being pink. Tiger skin is as striped as their fur. That's all I have to say about that. When toucans sleep, they curl into pretty tight balls. These birds can turn their head so that their tail covers their head and the beak rests on the back. So yeah, they have a ball. The ostrich has some of the largest eyes in the animal kingdom. They're more massive than a bird's brain. Each eye is as big as a billiard ball. All clownfish get born male, but in some circumstances, they can turn into females. This change is irreversible. Unlike most fish, when seahorses mate, they do it for life. Even cuter, when the mates travel, they move side by side and often hold on to each other's tails. The male usually gets stuck schlepping the luggage. Termites never sleep. They don't need to recharge their batteries. But they can eat 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, on your house. The sloth needs up to 2 weeks to digest its food. Hey, take your time, no hurry, nothing on the schedule. Dogs' nose prints can be used for their identification. They are similar to human fingerprints and unique for each animal. Owls don't have eyeballs. Instead, they have eye tubes that don't move in the eye sockets. Penguins don't have external ears, but their hearing is especially sharp. Especially when they're on the lookout for polar bears. Shh, let's not tell them. Jellyfish are up to 98% water. That's why when they get washed ashore, their bodies can evaporate into the air after just a few hours. 
If a traffic jam happens underwater, an alligator will always give way to a manatee. Nice manners. Grizzly bears have such a strong bite that they can crush a bowling ball. So it's smart just to let them win. Giant pandas aren't picky about their sleeping spots. They usually fall asleep wherever they are, in most cases, right on the forest floor. The giant panda's newborn cubs are tiny. They weigh like a small cup of coffee and are smaller than a mouse. The red handfish can walk along the ocean floor with the help of its hands. But of course, they are not hands, but evolved fins, really. Cats don't usually meow at each other. A study has shown the felines use this way of communication mostly to get attention from us humans. And it works. Sloths can't shiver. It's not that they're too busy digesting that two-week-old meal. Their fur is sometimes covered with algae. And when they get too hot or too cold, their metabolism shuts down. During the hard times, immortal jellyfish transform themselves back into their younger state. Once they reach the stage when they're nothing but a blob of tissue, like me, these creatures start to grow again. And this process can apparently repeat again and again. The closest living relatives of the T-Rex are chickens and ostriches. Don't turn your back. The moray eel has another set of jaws that can extend from his throat. First, the main jaws close around an unlucky sea creature. Then the additional set grabs the eel's future meal with backward-pointing razor-sharp teeth. And after that, the captured animal gets dragged back into the eel's throat. I just lost my appetite. Some species of snails have hairy shells. Thanks to these hairs, snails can better stick to wet surfaces. When humpback whales hunt, they often gather in a group and apply a bubble net tactic to catch their food. The bubbles don't let the schools of fish get away. Snow leopards can't roar like other large felines. It has to do with their less developed vocal cords. But these animals can meow, growl, hiss, and even purr. Not to drift away from their group while napping, sea otters hold hands. They can also entangle themselves in giant seaweed for the same purpose. Hey, it kelps. Lions are often called the king of the prairie. I thought it was the king of the jungle. And still, up to 90% of all the hunting in the pride is done by the females. The males are in charge of protecting the territory and the pride members. And they make the delicious potato salad known as Hakuna Matator. Cats are famous for their uncanny ability to move their ears. All because kitties have 32 muscles in each outer ear. Some shark species can glow in the dark. Unfortunately, only other sharks can see this greenish glimmer. You have up to 8,000 taste buds, but your pooch has just a bit over 1,500. The blue jay can imitate other birds. Its favorite is a hawk's call. The blue jay uses it to scare away other birds from its territory. Slow lorries are insanely cute and just as treacherous. They're the only known (laughs) venomous primates. They have a gland in the crook of their inner arm. It secretes toxins that can cause unpleasant consequences in people. The heart of beast has an amazing evasion tactic. To run away from other animals, they move in a zigzag pattern. Bottlenose dolphins have names for one another. Those are specific whistles. Hey, Bob. Hey, Charlie. Hey, Dolly. Hey, boys. And thanks for all the fish. Giraffes have long, and I mean it, black tongues. Scientists suppose this color might protect the tongue from getting sunburned. Well, that's all I got. See ya. Fail. Ah, what a waste of an hour running around with a rolled up newspaper trying to get that fly that keeps buzzing around your head. Well, three things. Why isn't it afraid of you? And why won't it just fly away? And how is it so incredibly fast? Flies actually have a pretty normal speed for their size. You're just a bit too slow. A tiny fly brain reacts several times faster than yours to what it sees. One second to the fly feels like five or six to you. 
When a fly looks at you, it sees you as if you're hanging out at the bottom of your local pool, moving around really slowly. What if you dropped a balloon from your bedroom window and watched it fall to the ground? That's how slow a fly sees regular things fall. So it has ninja reaction speeds, but it also has special eyes. They're divided into thousands of receptors that capture light all at the same time. You use small muscles to turn your eyes and head around to look in different directions. Flies don't have these muscles. They don't need them. They can see in every direction at the same time almost. No matter what side you attack from, that fly is almost definitely going to see it coming. You've probably seen supersonic planes in the movies, turning and flipping around at warp speed. A fly's kind of like that, but with way cooler wings. It can change directions mid-flight, stop, and dodge any obstacles. It can even calculate a flight strategy before it takes off. Well, this time you're really going to swat that fly. As you raise your rolled-up paper, the insect's brain calculates where it's going to land. The fly immediately puts its body in the perfect position, ready to perform an evasive maneuver. If your hand moves in front of the insect, its legs immediately tilt backwards to help it fly off in the other direction. Wow, that fly would make a great boxer or soccer goalie. So why does that fly even bother sticking around? You're always trying to squish it. Well, because your body is a five-star feast and your skin is the buffet table with row upon row of tasty treats. Mm. As you move about your day, your skin releases sweat, proteins, carbs, salt, sugar, and all other chemicals that flies are crazy about. Imagine you're hungry and thirsty, walking through a desert. You come over a tall sand dune and see it. Free food! Tables of fruit, candy, sandwiches, and the world's biggest soda fountain. The bouncer looks big, tough, round. It's a giant slow turtle. Now you know why the fly sticks around. You're the turtle. You actually do have a chance to get that fly. But it's still going to get away 8 times out of 10. Say a fly sitting on your kitchen table. Here's what you do. You need to aim a few inches in front of where you think it's going to fly to. The fly brain will think you're aiming right at it, so you can actually outwit the fly and take it by surprise. The problem? It's really hard to predict the fly's escape route. So you're too slow. How about calling in some backup? Meet the tiger beetle. Speed, 8 feet per second. It can't fly, but that doesn't matter. This beetle runs so fast, it loses the ability to see while it's moving. It aims itself at a target and then runs. It's not a ninja like the fly, and it can't change directions mid-sprint. It has to stop before each run. You walk it around 4.5 feet per second, so the beetle goes like twice your speed. But for its size, it's incredibly fast. It runs 125 lengths of its body in one second. Now, say you're 6 feet tall. You have to run 750 feet in one second. As long as it's on the same surface as that pesky fly, the fly doesn't stand a chance. Or maybe it's time to call in air support. The dragonfly is the fastest flying insect in the world. This little creature can reach 35 miles per hour. That's faster than you riding your bike down a steep hill. The dragonfly's wings also allow it to fly back, right, left, up and down, just like a helicopter. Doesn't matter how fast the fly moves, it's pretty much game over. Flies, dragonflies, and tiger beetles are fast because they don't want to spend a lot of extra time out in the open. There are a lot of hungry creatures around. But there's one insect that runs fast because if it stopped, ouch! To meet a speedy silver ant, you need to go to the Sahara Desert. The sand here is so hot, you could fry an egg on it. Mmm, sandy. That's why the silver ant speeds at around 2.5 feet per second. It doesn't want to burn its feet. It also has triangle-shaped hair that reflects heat, helping the ant escape the scorching sun. If that ant were human-sized, it could run at 400 miles per hour, faster than the fastest car in the world. There's another ant that holds a speed record. The Dracula ant can't run as fast as the silver ant, but it has the fastest mouth in the world, um, other than me. It can open and close its jaws 5,000 times, all in the blink of an eye. Literally. How about another fast one, this time a bit closer to home, or in it? 
The American cockroach can hide in the walls, behind the stove, pretty much anywhere. It's almost impossible to catch. It can run 5 feet per second. That's because of its six legs. Each one has three knees. Its legs are covered with small hairs that sense any change in the air. That's why it reacts so fast when you walk into the kitchen and turn the light on. And the world record for fastest creature on land is the size of a sesame seed. It's a type of mite, and it can move at 322 body lengths per second. If you zap the mite to turn it to human size, it could go almost two times faster than the speed of sound. The mite can even change direction while moving. That makes it the fastest, most elusive creature on the planet. But let's find some animals that actually make us feel good about ourselves. The garden snail. It belongs to the mollusk family, and it likes to take its sweet time. If you were moving at snail speed, you'd take two steps every two hours. But snails don't care. They've been around for hundreds of millions of years. Snails use their shell for protection, but they have other tricks too. Some snails give off a nasty smell so that no one bothers them. (laughs) If it gets too hot and dry, snails hide in their shells and seal themselves in using that cool slime they make. That slime also helps them climb up trees. Sloths are the slowest mammals on the planet. Thanks to their slow metabolism, food can take up to 16 days to get digested. Wouldn't be that hard to catch up to one of them. But their slowness actually helps them. You know how in the movies they say, stop, don't make any sudden movements? Well, a sloth has that part down cold. Other animals simply don't notice them up there among the leaves. Manatees are one of the slowest sea creatures. But they're not too worried about anyone messing with them, except for humans in motorboats. They are huge, and they have thick, thick skin. It's like a sea tank, but way cuter. Another slow swimmer is the Greenland shark. It swims at less than one mile per hour. Like the manatee, it's large and in charge. No one's likely to challenge it face to face. But this all leads to the most hilarious snacking technique ever. The Greenland shark is basically slower than every single fish in the water. The only chance it has is to wait for some of those fish to fall asleep. Then it's snack time. The cool thing is that their easygoing lifestyle actually prolongs their life. The average lifespan of a Greenland shark is 300 to 500 years. They live in the North Atlantic and Arctic oceans. Imagine you're on a cruise and you see one of these slow-motion giants. It might be 400 years older than you. Psst, run! Really? It's not safe out there. There's a saber-toothed tiger looking around. You better be careful. What are you doing? Don't peek. Okay, just one little beat. How's this possible, you ask? That's because you're in virtual reality, of course. These cool but very dangerous-looking big cats were alive during the last ice age. What if they decided to show up at your doorstep out of nowhere? Knock-knock! A saber-toothed tiger is waiting for you to buy its cookies. Meanwhile, the coelacanth, this massive-looking fish, comes from a lineage that's been around for over 300 million years. We thought they didn't exist anymore until 1938, that is, when a live coelacanth was found again. Since then, they've been roaming the waters of the east coast of Africa and the waters of Sulawesi, Indonesia. Man, I wouldn't want to go for a swim and meet one of these fellas face to face. Their jaw has an intracranial joint, which means their mouth opens up by a lot. This is so they can eat large prey, like me. Not good. They're huge, too. Imagine a fish that's as long as you're tall and weighing as much as an average human. The Takahe, a flightless bird, was thought to be gone in the year 1898. They're very cute, small and multicolored, usually not taller than your knee. But picture this. You're out for a hike in the Murkison Mountains. Looking around, you spot the bird you thought was extinct. But there they are, as happy as ever, surviving and chilling. A whole colonies of Takahes was indeed found just 50 years after they were pronounced extinct. Good job, tiny little birds! A singing dog. Ever heard of those? Riley does sing sometimes when he's bored or hungry, but these are real performers. 
New Guinea singing daws. They've been only recently discovered again in the wild for the first time in 50 years. Still, they were never completely extinct to begin with. New Guineans made sure they were safe next to them. But in the wild? Very rare and hard to catch a sight of. Look, there goes one. The New Guinea singing dogs are called so because of their famous high-pitched singing. They sometimes sing together, too. A dog choir of sorts, where they all howl together. I bet they sing better than I do in the shower. Not going far from this area, we have bats. But these ones are sort of different. You see, their ears are enormous. I guess that's why they're called the New Guinea big-eared bats. Clever. The species was found again when one of them was accidentally caught in a bat trap. Until then, I guess they were playing hide-and-seek with us, because up till 1890, they had been thought to be gone. They're still not out of the danger zone because of habitat loss. Imagine you discover a fossil of a species you thought had been extinct for a long time. Yet, two years later, a whole living group of said species is found. Well, this is exactly what happened in 1977 with the Majorcan midwife toad. It's sort of brownish in color with darker brown that makes up its skin spots. Other than that, it's just a small toad with googly eyes. The group of live toads was found close to where the fossil was on the island of Majorca. There aren't many of them left, about 500 in fact, and as of right now, they're declared vulnerable by the International Union for Conservation of Nature. Now, are you a fan of tortoises? You will be when you take a look at this huge beauty. It's called the Ferdinanda Island Galapagos tortoise. It hasn't been seen since 1906, but on February 17, 2019, we were finally able to look at one of these beautiful creatures. It's probably out there with a few of its mates right now, but they also don't allow themselves to be seen. We only know they exist because there's a few tracks and scents. With yet another frog, we have the horned marsupial frog. They're out and about in Ecuador, in the Chaco forest to be more specific. They're called this way because of their distinctive horns directly on top of their eyes. You know the pouch kangaroos use to carry their offspring? Well, the female horned marsupial frog also has that, except it's on the back, so it acts as sort of a backpack. They develop their embryos there, and when they're ready to come out, they hatch as complete infants, unlike regular frogs, where they start out as tadpoles. One more toad, the starry night toad, or harlequin toad. They're black and covered with loads of white spots all over them. Lost for 30 years, it was discovered back in 2019. Picture them as big bodyguards, water bodyguards to be exact. Oh, that's a very big toad on your screen. Well, for the Arawako people, that's exactly what they are, guardians of water. They also have their own name for them, guna. Sounds like a cheese. When scientists found them yet again, they came across 30 of these little creatures. But initially, they were expecting only one. Well, what a nice surprise. Here's a tiger for you, although it doesn't quite look like your typical tiger. It's called the Tasmanian tiger, and it seemingly disappeared since 1936. But then, out of nowhere, people started seeing them out there in the wild just five years ago in 2016. They sort of resemble dogs more than tigers, or a fox maybe. Just take a look at its muzzle. Maybe even a mix of both. Then, a few others started popping up too. And if you happen to think you're seeing one right in front of you, but you're not quite sure, check if they've got stripes on their back. They're definitely out there, but still technically marked as extinct by the IUCN. Okay, picture a horse that looks straight out of a movie scene. Tiny, gorgeous fur, very well behaved. It's tiny, but it's not a pony. It's a Caspian horse. They have an interesting backstory to them. They were discovered by Louise Leyland, who got married to an aristocrat in 1957. Having moved to Tehran, Iran, she didn't quite like how the horses behaved there, so she took matters into her own hands. She took a few people with her, and off they went to the Caspian Sea Mountain. And in there, 
they found three of these beautiful tiny little horses. Well, that's how the story goes. Coming up next, a possum that was found in an unexpected place. Guess where? You have three options to pick from. Hiding in a ski resort, in the Australian outback, or in someone's apartment in the bathroom. Which one do you choose? You have three seconds. The right answer is a ski resort. Yes, this possum is called the mountain pygmy possum, and it's originating from Australia. So far, there are three different living populations of this tiny possum, but it was believed to be extinct until just 1966. There are fewer than 100 of them, so the IUCN has marked them as critically endangered. Also from Australia is the night parrot, an absolute delight to birdwatchers. Very beautiful, yet mysterious. These little fellas live in very remote areas. You can probably count on the fingers of your hand how many times these birds have been seen since they were found again in 1979. That's how rare they are. Have you ever seen a pygmy tarsier? Neither have I. It was only in 2008 that three of them were caught. Scientists don't really want to lose track of their movements again, so what they did was gift them with tiny little collars. This way they can live their life as happy as ever and will know they're safe. The last one I want to tell you about is the tree lobster. But as the name might mistakenly tell you, they're not really lobsters. They're just big black bugs with huge legs. Their extinction story is a sad one. In 1920, a cargo ship got stuck on Lord Howe Island, and it had rats aboard. These rats fled the ship and ran straight to land. Even though tree lobsters are bigger than most insects, they're still relatively small compared to rats. The poor things never stood a chance. Still, in 2004, life shone again for these distinct critters. A pair of Australian scientists were out and about on the island and came across 24 of them. All of them were living beneath one single shrub. Hey, if there's enough space for everyone, it's not small, it's cozy. Bottom line, it's better to be distinct than extinct. Don't you agree? Despite their cold-blooded nature, crocodiles and alligators are some of the most caring and gentle parents in the animal world. Come on, really? Yeah? Females of these frightening animals lay from 10 to 60 eggs at a time, and then bury their eggs in riverside nests. They build the nests out of plants they break off with their teeth and push together using back legs. Then croc moms patiently wait up to three months, protecting their future babies from any danger. Although crocodiles themselves are very strong and frightening animals, they don't hesitate to hire special babysitters to protect their nests. The water thick knees. It might seem like a risky deal, but these birds have formed a win-win alliance with crocs. They place their eggs nearby and, together, they scare away big reptiles like Nile monitors and other predators. Crocodiles have an excellent sense of hearing. Bird cries alert the mother about all uninvited guests, and the mama croc goes out of the water to protect her babies and bird nests along the way. When baby crocodiles are born, they're of a size of a large banana, and it takes years for them to reach maturity, from 4 to 15 years, depending on the species. In some cases, a female crocodile helps her babies to hatch by putting the eggs in her mouth and rolling them. Then she what? Spits out a kid? Apparently so. Baby crocs tend to stay together close to their mommy during the first one to three years of life. The mother assists her children in digging out of the nest and carries them to the water in her mouth. A female crocodile can place up to 15 babies in her mouth at once, and instincts prevent her from closing her jaws. So newly hatched babies feel safe in the crocodile's mouth as if it were a cradle with teeth. Although the croc teaches her babies to hunt and provides protection from predators, only about 1% of the hatchlings survive to adulthood due to predators and weather conditions. Sad news for any parent, but crocs are cold-blooded reptiles after all. The only reason they cry is physiological rather than emotional. When crocs spend enough time out of the water, their eyes get so dry that they cry to keep them lubricated. If a baby crocodile manages to survive its childhood, 
it gets the chance to live a very long life. Just like some other reptiles, turtles, and whales, crocodiles exhibit the so-called negligible senescence, or in simple words, a lack of normal aging. It means they don't actually get older, just bigger and badder. They're only afraid of getting sick or being attacked by other predators. Although the average lifespan of crocodiles varies from 50 to 70 years, some of them reach over 100 years. So in theory, someone may meet a 500-year-old crocodile as huge as an airplane somewhere deep in the tropics. But the chances to survive and tell the tale of this meeting are slim, because the crocodile's appetite grows in proportion to its body. Mr. Freshy, who passed away at the age of 140 years, was the oldest documented crocodile that was in captivity. It was caught in the Moorhead River in 1970 and resided at the Australian Zoo. Mr. Freshy was called after its kind, freshwater crocodile, the breed that has never been witnessed doing any harm to humans. At the age of 10, when crocodiles reach the body length of about 5 to 10 feet, they become mature enough to give birth to their own babies. The mating dance involves several steps. Males produce a special low-frequency sound which humans can't perceive. But for crocodile females, it sounds like an invitation to become a mother and continue the gentle parenting tradition. Hey, could we call this the crocodile rock? Hey, I like that song. Of course, crocodiles are not the only animals that demonstrate surprisingly high family values and dedication. Polar bears, for example, are very attentive and take time to teach their cubs all necessary survival skills in the cold climate. While the babies are still in their mother's belly, polar bears construct a special space by digging into deep snowdrifts. This space serves as a home for the future cubs. They spend their first months of their life getting milk and heat from their mother. Polar bears usually give birth in a period between November and January and don't allow the cubs to get out until spring. The newborn's fur is very fine, and they're not yet ready to face severe colds. Once the cubs emerge from the den, the mother bear begins to teach them how to survive in the outside world. Babies mimic her every move, learning how to swim, hunt, build dens, and migrate. Mother will fight off predators and larger polar bears and hide her cubs from any threat. After two to three years together, babies learn everything they need to know and leave her. But they'll still be able to recognize their mother throughout their life, which lasts up to 30 years. Another example of caring motherhood can be found among our close relatives, primates. Gorillas, chimpanzees, and bonobos, a cousin of the chimp, embrace and kiss their newborns just like humans. While feeding their little ones, primate females release special hormones associated with motherhood feelings and gentleness. When it comes to breastfeeding, orangutans are the champions. This process may continue for up to 8 years. In the wild, orangutan mothers nurse their offspring for up to 7 years, which is longer than any other primate. During this period, mothers teach their infants to find food and build sleeping nests on their own. The bond between female orangutans and their mothers is stronger than that of males. Daughters may continue living with mothers until they reach the childbearing age that equals 15 or 16 years. Yeah, they just won't move out. Just like humans, apes may have mother issues that impact their social life. Maternal support helps young primates to gain dominance and mating success when they grow up. On the other hand, apes who didn't get enough nurturing in their childhood tend to have fewer children when they reach maturity. Meanwhile, males of African elephants don't fight for dominance because all important issues are resolved by females. And every calf in the herd is cared for by everyone equally. A young elephant mother gets the assistance of her sisters and older aunts while giving birth and raising her child. That's why elephants are considered some of the most protective moms on the planet. Herds of female elephants and children tend to travel together in a special circle. They put the youngest members of the group inside the circle to protect them from predators. Also, older elephants will adjust the pace of the herd so the calves don't get tired and lag behind. Females in the social group will communicate with babies using affectionate gestures and teach them how to find food. And everyone packs their own trunk. <laughs> By the way, girl elephants are very attached to their mothers and will typically remain together until the mother passes away from old age. And the average lifespan of elephants is around 65 years or even more. Mothers bear the cubs for two years of that time, so no surprise they're so attached to each other. 
Giraffe females also have a long pregnancy period, 15 months. But it makes sense because the giraffe calf is already on its feet very soon after birth. Mother nurses giraffe babies for about 9 to 12 months. When she needs to go find some food, she will hide her babies or ask other giraffes to look after them. Like humans, giraffe moms need to stay awake. They can afford to sleep from 30 minutes to a couple of hours a day. And even that in extremely short periods, like 5 to 10 minutes at a time. The remaining time is dedicated to guarding and protecting her babies. Emperor penguin mothers are not afraid of difficulties either. After laying an egg, the female leaves it with a male who protects it from any threat. Meanwhile, the mother takes a long journey of up to 50 miles to reach the ocean shore and catch some fish. When the fishing is over, she returns to the hatch site to feed the fish to her newly hatched babies. Mmm, seafood! Using the warmth of her own body, the penguin female keeps the younger generation safe and warm. There's a lake in the heart of Asia that holds one-fifth of all the world's liquid freshwater. It's more than all the five Great Lakes have together. Even if all the rivers on our planet suddenly change their direction and set on a mission to drain this lake, it would take them a whole year to finish the job. I'm talking about the deepest lake in the world, Lake Baikal. If you decide to go all the way down to its deepest point, prepare for a journey of almost 5,400 feet. The descent takes several hours. But the rift floor of the lake is way deeper, between 5 to 7 miles beneath the surface. It means it could be even further down than the Challenger Deep, which is the deepest known place on Earth. The amount of water it has would be enough for everyone on Earth to have something to drink for up to 50 years. This mighty giant of a lake replenishes its water completely every 383 years. Baikal has a great delivery crew of over 300 rivers and streams, bringing their waters right in. And only one river flows out of Baikal, the Angara, which is headed straight for the Arctic Ocean. Baikal isn't only the deepest, but also the oldest existing freshwater lake in the world. It formed at least 25 million years ago. It all began when the Earth's crust decided to play Tetris and created the lake and the surrounding mountains. At some point, Baikal must have been just a humble riverbed. But then, tremors and fractures shook the earth, and the distance between the shores got bigger. Water levels rose thanks to the melting glaciers. Then, several lakes formed and later merged into one. Baikal is one of around 20 lakes in the world that are older than 1 million years. And since it wasn't disturbed by glacial periods, it's a perfect research ground for scientists. Its deep-drilled core sediments can tell a lot about the climate of our planet in different periods. Since Baikal is in a rift basin with 2,000 seismic tremors per year, the lake is deepening and still growing in size. Its shores drift apart at around the same rate as South America and Africa are moving away from each other, so it has all the potential to become an ocean. Another thing Baikal has in common with the oceans is that it has water rich in oxygen, even at its lowest depths. This is one of the reasons why the fauna of the lake is so incredibly rich. It's home to over two and a half thousand various animals and 1,000 plant varieties. Around half of them are unique and only exist in this area, like the endemic algae, the Baikal omul fish, and the Baikal oil fish. There are also some bears elk and lynx living on its shores. They must appreciate the fact that the temperatures around the lake are always higher than the rest of Siberia, thanks to its huge water mass. Most Baikal dwellers prefer to stick to the bottom of the lake, but there's one brave guy you'll meet if you decide to visit. Meet the Baikal seal, also known as Nerpa. It's the only true freshwater seal in the world. Nerpa's eyes are so cute, it nearly landed the part of Puss in Boots in Shrek. Nerpa in Boots sounds good to me. These huge eyes are there to help them follow their favorite pelagic fish underwater. There are other seal kinds that can handle fresh water or use it to breathe, but these cuties spend their entire lives in it. But wait, 
how did seals, which are supposed to be oceanic creatures, end up in a lake miles and miles away from the sea? About 400,000 years ago, during the Pleistocene era, these adventurous creatures traveled up the river and drainage systems that connected Lake Baikal to the Arctic Ocean. The ringed seal that still lives in the Arctic is believed to be the Baikal seal's closest ancestor. Today, Baikal seals are confined to their freshwater home because of the changes in waterways. And they seem to be pretty happy with their home as they can choose from a huge variety of food to eat. The seals mostly hang out in the north and central areas of the lake, but move south in the winter. The lake gets covered with ice, which they use as a chill-out zone, just like their oceanic cousins use rocks or the beach. Since at least 1969, Lake Baikal has had some mysterious ice rings pop up randomly here and there. At some point, they got so big that the astronauts even spotted them from space. The rings usually appear in late April, but can be there in January or May. Scientists couldn't crack the code on how these rings form for a while. They had all sorts of theories, and the most popular involved methane gas bubbles from the lake's depths. But then, scientists noticed that some of the rings were in shallower waters, where gas emissions don't happen. So, an international team of scientists decided to solve the mystery. They traveled to Lake Baikal, drilled holes in the ice, and dropped sensors into the water. In 2016, when they started the research, they heard that two vans had gotten stuck in the mysterious ice rings. Once they had analyzed the data from the sensors, it turned out that the secret behind the rings was warm eddies flowing clockwise under its ice cover. The currents were less intense in the center of the eddies, so the ice above them was thicker at the edges. The waters of the lake are so clear that you can see some extremely deep parts up to over 130 feet down. This is thanks to the surrounding mountains that send off melting ice right in. Plankton that live in the lake also helps clean the floating debris. When this crystal clear water freezes, it forms an unusually thick and see-through layer of ice. The wind likes to play sculptor on Baikal and creates one-of-a-kind pieces of art here. It picks up water which, of course, freezes into the most unusual designs. Frozen bubbles and icicles you've never seen before. The location and geography of the lakes and the cycles of melting and refreezing create the perfect conditions for this ice workshop. And you can even see rocks that seem to be floating. The bottom of the rock freezes to the surface of the ice. Then, the strong winds wear away the surroundings, leaving a perfect pedestal for the rock. If you think the floating rocks look eerie, how about Baikal's version of the Loch Ness Monster? The local Buryat people have a legend about the water dragon master that lives in the lake. A dragon is believed to be the most powerful creature living on Earth in Asian mythology. They believe there are four dragons living in the four seas, each responsible for one of the cardinal directions. Baikal is the North Sea in this story, the image of this dragon is supposedly etched in ancient petroglyphs on the cliffs of Baikal. There's also a hefty stone slab that looks like a monument dated back to somewhere between the 3rd and the 9th century BCE, depicting a mysterious water monster. Imagine the stories this stone could tell, echoing the whispers of a bygone era and leaving us to unravel the enigma of the Baikal cliffs. The legend says that a local warrior was chasing the dragon. He finally reached the largest Baikal island of Alkan. He was ready to face and defeat the dragon, but the beast turned into a beautiful girl, and they got married. That's one unusual twist to a classic defeat the dragon and take the girl story. So, local legends describe that dragon as a giant sturgeon with an almost gator-like snout and armored body. In reality, the mythical monster must be one of the many huge fish living in the lake. They can afford to grow to several feet in length thanks to the high levels of oxygen in the water. Beluga sturgeon can weigh several thousands of pounds, lives up to 50 or 60 years, and never stops growing. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your